Hello, and welcome to this speed briefing on a report that we released on Sunday night, Monday, fueling tax repair, fueling budget repair. It looks at the fuel tax credit system for business. Since we released the report, there's been a lot of media attention and there's been also significant interest from federal politicians from the National Party, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party and the Crossbench. We're going to take you through a short slide deck today to give you the highlights of the report, but I'll start by giving you uh, what the report is about in a nutshell. So the federal budget has a structural deficit of about $40 billion a year. Fuel tax credits are gnawing away at more and more of the revenue from fuel tax. So our proposal is to remove fuel tax credits entirely for on-road vehicles and approximately half them for off-road users of diesel and other fuels. The savings would be about $4 billion a year. It would bring the fuel tax system more into line with the government's commitment to reducing emissions by 43% by 2030 and it would have a very small impact on households' cost of living and on business. So we'll take you through the more detailed findings. I'll start off by talking to you about the revenue. So gross fuel tax raises more than $20 billion a year, but fuel tax credits reduce this by close to $8 billion. A decade ago, as you can see on this slide, the fuel tax credit reduced the gross revenue by 30%. Today, it's almost 40%. So the savings from our proposal would amount to about $4 billion a year, and that's about 10% of the structural deficit. The fuel tax system is a bit complicated. Um, the way it works is uh, fuel tax is imposed at a current rate of $0.48 cents per litre, um, but not all fuel use attracts the charge. So private users, when you and I fill up our cars, we pay the full amount of fuel tax and we also pay GST on the fuel price and GST on the fuel tax. Light vehicles that are used by businesses do pay the full rate of fuel tax, um, but like all business users, they, they don't pay the GST on it and they can tax deduct their expenses. Heavy on-road vehicles, that's larger than four and a half tonnes, pay a reduced rate of fuel tax. They pay 27.2 cents a litre. And no tax at all is payable for vehicles that only drive off-road and for other off-road uses of diesel and other fuels. One of the complications about this too is that businesses pay these rates in different stages. They pay the full fuel tax at the Bowser. They subsequently get their full or partial rebate via their BAS statement, business activity statement to the tax office. And subsequently, again, they get a tax deduction for the remaining fuel costs. So that's how it works. Um, it's often said that uh, fuel tax uh, is needed to pay for roads. This is actually not the case. It's not hypothecated to roads, and it hasn't been since uh, 1959. There's essentially a very limited, if any, connection between what is spent on roads and what is raised from fuel excise. There has been a long history of governments changing uh, fuel tax to suit the, uh, their imperatives of the day. Um, these days, it's uh, what, what we find is, or it's been only since two, 2006 that fuel uh, tax credits have been extended uh, to heavy vehicles on road and to other off-road uses. This chart shows you, um, though, about the concern that people raise sometimes that fuel tax revenue is going to wither away because we're getting more and more electric vehicles. So we, we would expect that um, electrification and greater fuel efficiency will lead to um, continuing decline in the fuel tax revenue, but they're not the whole story. They're, they're, what you can see here is that there have been several important policy decisions that have reduced uh, that have that sort of eaten into the, the net fuel excise revenue, a couple of decisions associated with the introduction of the GST and also widening eligibility to more uses over time. 
I'm going to now, um, uh, in, in fact, we, we've charted some of these changes and you can see 2006 was, in, um, there were some important extensions of the scheme uh, to, to more uses. Um, and that's the basis of the scheme that you see today, the extension to all heavy on-road vehicles and to other off-road vehicle uses that that um, people, that, that businesses are, are using today over time. It started off as a much more restricted scheme. I think one of the other things to mention is that as the scheme has been extended over time, it's often been associated with explicit statements that it's supposed to help regional areas. So it's a bit of context on the scheme. I'll now pass over to Tash to talk you through the nuts and bolts of our proposal. It's rare to be able to raise additional tax revenue without efficiency losses, but we make the case in our report that reforming fuel tax credits is also good tax policy. The usual tax orthodoxy is not to tax business inputs, and that's because we don't want to distort the way businesses choose to produce their goods. But the exception comes when an input itself causes harm to others. And that's the case with burning diesel. When businesses use diesel in their production processes, they cause harm to the community above and beyond what is captured by current fuel taxes. And the relevant harm to the community takes the form of carbon emissions, of air pollution, and of damage and demand for our roads. There are also other costs to diesel that we don't deal with in our report, and that's because we don't think they'll be well dealt with using fuel taxes. And those are things like traffic congestion or accidents. So we'll take you through our proposal, starting with heavy on-road vehicles. Currently, heavy on-road vehicles only pay a tax of 27 cents per litre, and that's intended to reflect the damage they do to our roads. They're then given a credit on the rest of their fuel tax that they paid at the Bowser, and that's currently 20.5 cents per litre. But what we show in our report is that the harm that these vehicles do to the community is well above what they're currently paying. So I'll step through what these harms are. The first one we talk about is carbon emissions. And while the price of carbon is still uncertain, there's no disputing that a price of zero is too low. In our report, we've used a fairly conservative carbon price of $75 per tonne, and that comes out at 20 cents per litre for diesel fuel. Now, $75 per tonne is low compared to the internal carbon prices that many of the companies that would be brought under this scheme use to guide their investment decisions already. Uh, so several companies uh, use internal carbon prices of more than $100 per tonne. These include companies like Toll, BHP, BP, Newmont and Rio Tinto. If we used uh, an even higher carbon price of $140 a tonne, which is more reflective of the offset price in more developed markets like the European Union, you'd be adding an, about an extra $0.17 cents per litre onto that price. The second cost that we look at is air pollution. Now, exhaust pipe pollution causes all kinds of damage to our health, including through respiratory illnesses and impairing our cognitive function. The problem with air pollution is that it's a very localised effect and the harms are much greater in capital cities where more of the population live and therefore are impacted by the pollution. And so the rate we've used here is two cents per litre as a cost for air pollution. And that just reflects the costs that we estimate for regional areas. In order to deal with air pollution in cities, you would need a range of other policies. The final cost that we look at are these road construction and maintenance costs. As I said, these are already incorporated into the price that these heavy on-road vehicles pay but it's been undercharged for several years. So since about 2015, the um, federal ministers have chosen not to increase the rate of the road user charge that these heavy vehicles pay, despite the National Transport Commission estimating that these have risen quite substantially over time. So currently the rate that these heavy vehicles are paying is about 40% less than what 
their costs are estimated to be. And so we're proposing that this rate would increase to reflect the full rate of these costs. So that brings us to our proposal, which is that given that the harms that these vehicles do to the community is well above what the current fuel tax rate is, we propose that on-road users will lose the credit entirely. So they'll just pay the full rate of 47.7 cents per litre. The second group that we look at are the off-road users of fuel. Now, the off-road users still cause the same air pollution and carbon emission costs that the on-road users do. However, they of course don't use the roads. And there's been a lot of misinformation in the media this week about um, off-road users suddenly being forced to pay for roads. Um, in fact, what we're recommending is a different rate for off-road users to reflect the fact that they don't use the roads. So our proposal is that off-road users will go from paying no fuel tax to paying about 22 cents per litre, um, and that's to reflect the harm that they do to the community through carbon emissions and air pollution. So as well as um, businesses covering the costs they impose to the community, we make two further arguments in the report as to why this is a good tax policy. Firstly, there is currently a discrepancy between what light business vehicles pay and what heavy business vehicles pay for their use of our roads. Currently, light business vehicles pay the full tax rate of 47.7 cents per litre. Now, this is vehicles like taxis or delivery drivers or tradies that do primarily use their vehicles for business but still have to pay this full rate, while heavy road vehicles pay the lower rate. And so what we're proposing is that we even out the tax rates between these two businesses uh, or two types of vehicles so that they both pay the full 48 cents per litre. And that removes any incentive for businesses to buy larger vehicles um, that do more damage to our roads than light vehicles um, in order to pay a lower rate of tax. Of course, the off-road vehicles would pay a slightly lower rate. Um, and as I said, that reflects that they aren't using our roads and so shouldn't pay for road damage costs. The final reason that we propose that this is a good tax policy is that fuel taxation is a very simple tax. It's paid by importers or producers of fuel um, at the point that it leaves the storage depot or the terminal. And so it's already built into the price that users pay for their fuel. And so this means um, it's almost impossible to avoid paying. And the complication really comes through this credit system. We're also recommending that fuel paid uh, for powering auxiliary equipment. So that's things like turning the concrete in your truck or refrigerating um, the contents of your truck would all come under the same um, on-road arrangement while currently businesses try and calculate the fuel used for either part, um, propelling the vehicle or other things. And for government, there would be less need um, for the National Transport Commission to keep estimating the damage or demand costs that heavy vehicles use because we're proposing this will be a set rate that's just indexed to CPI over time. Um, and this is this rate that they estimate has, as I said, been ignored by ministers for several years. Um, and so it's not really being used anyway. And also the main data source that is used to estimate it has recently been discontinued. So there would be challenges going forward to continue estimating it anyway. So that sums up why we think that this is good tax policy. I'm just going to pass back to Marion to talk you through the impacts on households and businesses. So I'll start with the impacts on households. Um, so the single biggest impact for households would be on groceries. And uh, our uh, estimate is that the price of a $100 shop at the supermarket would rise to, by 35 cents to $100.35 if these reforms were introduced. And the 35 cents comes about through two separate mechanisms. Firstly, because transport costs would increase a little, um, uh, that would add 0.1 of 1% or 10 cents on a $100 item on average. So this is assuming that businesses passed on the full cost to consumers. So the increase 
to transport costs, as you can see in this chart, would be an average of 2.7%. And the cost of freighting a good, it does vary, of course, but it typically constitutes about 5% of the final retail price. So that's how we get to 10 cents um, on a $100 shop is, is can be attributed to an increase in transport costs. The other part of the cost um, would be, would come about because agricultural items produced in Australia would also go up by a very small amount. So the additional increase in the costs faced by Australian agricultural producers would mostly be less than 1%, and that's what this chart is showing you. Um, and the farmer's price is about half the price to get it to the shop and about half the cost of a typical trolley is spent on things like meat, dairy, fruit and vegetables most of which are produced in Australia. So that, that's how we get to 25 cents for the agriculture impact plus 10 cents for the transport is 35 cents on a $100 shop, so it's very, very small. I'll turn now to business impacts. Um, so the impact on businesses that receive the credit would mostly be small. So I'll step you through the argument. Um, so the industries that get the great majority of fuel tax credits are first and foremost mining um, is by far the largest recipient industry, followed by transport, agriculture, construction and manufacturing. And those are the five industries that we focus on. Um, and I would also point out they're particularly high emitting industries. So these five industries out of 19 industries in Australia contribute more than half of Australia's carbon emissions. So I'll go into a bit more depth on those five. First of all, looking at the cost additions to businesses in these industries would mostly be less than 1%. In fact, mostly less than half of 1%. There would be larger average cost increases likely to occur in transport, um, and particularly for micro, small and medium businesses, and also slightly larger for the big miners at about 0.8 of 1%. So. Um, we focus, therefore, in more depth on these two groups of particular interest, smaller businesses, especially transport, and exporters. So I'll take them one at a time, starting with the smaller businesses. So we were concerned that this might have a detrimental impact on smaller businesses, but um, one thing that's really important to recognise here is that smaller businesses mostly don't claim fuel tax credits. So looking at these five key industries, the great majority of large businesses with turnover of $100 million or more claim credits, but only a tiny minority of, firm, of small firms with turnover up to 200,000 claim credits. And that effect is particularly pronounced in transport, where almost none of the very large number of businesses who've got turnover up to $50,000 claim the credits. Well, almost all of the very few businesses with turnover of more than 100 million claim credits. So there's a few possible reasons for this. One is that smaller businesses may be tending to operate smaller vehicles, less than 4.5 tonnes, so they're already locked out of this system. And there's another reason, too, that if they're operating larger trucks but they're pre-1996, they do have to comply with more regulation to be eligible for fuel tax credits and may elect not to do that. Um, we have suggested all the same, though, that the government could soften the transition by offering grants for a three-year period. Um, so the, the vast majority of transport companies have got turnover below $2 million a year, and their average claim is at $8,300, um, and for agriculture, $5,800. So uh, grants that were capped at 10,000 in year one, 7,000 in year two, 3,000 in year three, and then zero would allow, uh, you know, new contracts to be written that reflect this and allow um, companies just to adapt uh, in whatever way they need to. So that, that was the story with smaller businesses. I'm now going to turn to exporters. So fuel tax credits are substantially directed to export industries, particularly uh, mining and agriculture. So we showed earlier that large mining companies with turnover of more than $100 million would have slightly higher costs at about 0.8 or 1%. And this reflects the fact that large miners do get sub substantial fuel tax credits at present. 
This chart shows you that the top 10 mining recipients alone claimed over $1.7 billion worth of fuel tax credits in 2020-21. So the normal uh, orthodoxy is that if you raise tax, you'll lower exports. But there's two counter arguments to this um, that I'd like to put forward. One counter argument is that exporters would still face a low effective carbon price by global standards, at least for now. So Australia's car implied tax on carbon from fuel taxes is in the bottom quarter of OECD countries for both on and off road use. And the second argument is that the writing is on the wall for the advantage that fuel intensive Australian export industries currently enjoy. So countries around the world are increasingly instituting mechanisms to push economic activity towards lower emitting practices. For example, nearly all OECD countries have committed to net zero by 2050, and those countries are the destination for a third of our exports. And as well, um, we're seeing the European Union, for example, implementing a a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And this is a levy at the border on the embedded carbon content of certain products. And, and what it will do is put European producers who face a higher carbon tax or carbon price on a fair footing with producers in countries with low or no carbon tax. So this has happened in Europe. It's already agreed. It's gone through the parliament. Um, and the UK, the US and Canada are looking to follow suit. Finally, um, another way to put into perspective our recommended changes, there have always been significant fluctuations in the price of fuel. It's not unusual for the price of diesel to fluctuate 30 cents per litre or more between years, which is a lot more than our proposed change of 22.1 cents per litre. So uh, just to sum up with our recommendations, um, we're recommending that fuel tax credits should be removed for heavy on-road vehicles. Um, those are the vehicles larger than 4.5 tonnes and including when the fuel is used to power auxiliary equipment and that fuel, diesel and other fuels used off-road should receive fuel tax credits at a reduced rate, 25.6 cents per litre, increasing their effective tax rate to 22.1 cents per litre. So to sum up, our proposed overhaul of fuel tax credits would contribute to budget repair. It would help Australia to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. There would be an improvement to the efficiency of the tax system and the impact on households would be tiny. Thank you for listening. For more information on this report, please go to www.grattan.edu.au.